Morning, everyone. Good to see you all. It's it's a joy to gather in the name of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. And we are very nearing our Christmas season, aren't we? And we're, we are basically in it. Uh, you see the Christmas decorations up in the shops, people starting to make their uh, Christmas decorations on their lawn. It's beautiful. It's a great reminder of joy. It's a great reminder of peace on earth. And I really do want to encourage us to take every opportunity to talk to people about Jesus and remind people of the hope that comes in knowing Christ. Let me read for us from Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. This was an angel speaking to Joseph, and he said this, She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Father, we rejoice that Jesus is Lord. We rejoice that Jesus is risen. We praise you for the hope of everlasting life that we have in Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you that you are our God. You love us. You know us intimately. You know us by name. You know the number of hairs on our heads. You know every single sin that we commit, and yet you still love us. We are sorry for our sin, sorry for our rebellion against you, sorry when we have harbored bitter uh, thoughts and anger and rage in our hearts. Please, Father, forgive us. Please help us to see the gravity of our sin and our desperate need for you. We thank you that you would love us regardless. We thank you that Jesus died for us, not when we were perfect, but when we were sinners. And so we pray that we would live our lives as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to you. And we pray that our service today would honour you, and we pray that you would draw us closer to yourself. In Jesus' name, Amen. We're going to hear from God's Word, and I'll invite Norma to come up, and she's going to read for us from Exodus chapter 6, verse 1 to 9. Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. Because of my mighty hand, he will let them go. Because of my mighty hand, he will drive them out of his country. God also said to Moses, I am the Lord. I appeared to appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself fully known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan where they resided as foreigners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the Israelites whom the Egyptians are enslaving, and I have remembered my covenant. Therefore, Say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. We are going to continue our time worshipping God in prayer. And so let us come before the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you hear our prayers. And Father, we come before you thankful that you answer our prayers according not to our desire, but to your desires. You know what's best for us. You know what we need for godliness. You know what we need to conform us to the image of Christ. Father, we thank you for Oran Park Anglican School and the students that will be coming this week, or sorry, that have come this week, to help our community. We thank you for the wonderful night of youth group that was had yesterday with the students, and we thank you that many students heard the gospel and were challenged to know that their identity is not found in all the good work they do but ought to be found in Jesus Christ. We pray, Father, thanking you that uh, these students will come to bless our community, and we thank you. Uh, we pray for them that you would give them strength and rest this week as they do various uh, volunteering tasks uh, to uh, help out uh, various uh, organisations and groups in the town. Father, we also want to pray for uh, our own uh, church family. We pray for those among us who are not well. 
We also pray for our immediate family, those who we know who are sick, unwell, and struggling with illness, loneliness. Father, we take a moment to entrust those who are wrestling with sickness or other concerns. We take a moment to entrust them into your care. Father, we thank you that you are the God of all comfort, and you comfort us with an everlasting comfort that comes in knowing Christ. We pray, Father, that we would be vessels of your love, and we would display to people the true comfort that comes in knowing Jesus. And so when we struggle with illness, when we struggle with sickness, when we struggle with the, cert uh, the uncertainty of cancer or death or whatever it might be, <clears throat> we pray that when the world looks at us, they would see a sure and certain hope that comes in Christ. We pray, Father, that you would draw people to the gospel, draw people to repentance, draw people to faith. Father, we plead for our lost family members and friends and people in the community who don't know Jesus. We want them to be saved. We want them to come to a living hope. We want them to receive eternal life. Please, Father, work salvation in their hearts by your Spirit. And we pray that we would be the vessels by which you use to preach the gospel to them. Father, we pray for the world around, especially in times of conflict. We pray for the situation in Ukraine and Russia. Father, we know that there are many conflicts that happen all around the world every day that people don't hear about. And Father, lately it seems like the conflict in Ukraine and Russia has been pushed off the radar. But Father, we do want to remember that there is conflict there and in Israel and the Middle East and Palestine. Father, these conflicts, they're beyond us. What can we do? But Father, we know that you are sovereign. You are in control. And so we pray, Father, that you would bring about peace on earth. We pray that people would be reconciled by the blood of Christ. We know that Jesus came to reconcile not only people and you, but he came to reconcile people with one another too. Jews and Gentiles reconciled together. And so we pray that these nations that war against one another would find peace at the foot of the cross. And we pray, Father, that they would lay down their arms and embrace one another as men and women made in the image of God. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather to read your word, and we pray, Father, that you would speak to us today. And together we say the Lord's Prayer as the Lord Jesus Christ taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Reading from the book of Timothy, chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Saviour, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. This has now been witnessed to at the proper time, and for this purpose I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I am telling the truth, I am not lying, and a true and faithful teacher of the Gentiles. If you could keep your Bibles open to 1 Timothy 2, that'll be great. Over the past couple of weeks, we've just been going through uh, 1 Timothy um, chapter by chapter, and so today we're up to chapter 2. And if you uh, were following on the reading, you'll notice that uh, the passage afterwards is the controversial passage on uh, what Paul had to say about uh, women and uh, what he meant when he uh, encouraged uh, uh, women uh, to allow men to teach and have authority. Very controversial passage. I'll be looking at this next week, and I've been wrestling with, with it for uh, the past couple of weeks as well. So if you could pray for me that I'd be able to speak uh, 
yeah, what the passage has to say and that God would speak to us next week, that will be great. So I encourage you to come along to that if that uh, interests you. And so today we are going to be looking at 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 to 7. And so as we consider this passage, it's good to pray. And so let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We pray, Father, that you would speak to us. We pray, Father, that you would encourage us. And we pray, Father, that you would give us a heart for the lost. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Do you have family or friends who don't know Jesus? Maybe it's your children. Maybe it's your spouse. Maybe it's your parents. Maybe it's a close friend. Maybe it's someone in the community that you know. And you've been praying for them for years and years and years. And it breaks your heart that they don't know Jesus. But it's been so long that you've been praying that you felt like giving up hope. How would this person come to Christ? They'll never come to Christ, you think to yourself. Today's passage in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 to 7, encourages us not to give up hope. Today's passage reminds us that there's always hope for those who are lost. And so all I'm going to do today in today's sermon is remind us and shed light on how this passage helps us to continue praying and pleading to God for the salvation of our friends and those we love. Paul starts off the passage in verse 1. Please do keep your Bibles open. I think that's really important as a church. I can't emphasize um, how important it is to keep our Bibles open. Paul starts off the passage in verse 1, urging us to pray. Petitions, prayers, intercession, thanksgiving. And so what you see here is there's pleading, isn't there? There's a desire for God to work. There's request. There's thanksgiving as well. There's a posture and attitude of trusting God. And who do we pray for? Paul says in verse 1, we pray for all people. Not some people, not most people. We pray for all people. We pray for the people of tomorrow, our community. We want them to come to know Christ. We want them to be called out of darkness into marvelous light. We want them to see the great hope that comes in trusting Jesus. And in line with praying for all people, Paul encourages us to pray, verse 2, for kings and for all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. When Christians are allowed to live peacefully and quiet lives, think religious freedoms, think freedom to worship God. When Christians are allowed to live in peace, That creates a context where people are more readily able to consider Christ. I'm not saying that it has to be that context. I'm not saying it doesn't happen in persecution. But it does create a context when there is peace that people are more readily able to consider Christ. I have a lecturer. Let me give you an example. I have a, sorry, I have a friend, not a lecturer. I have a friend who's a pastor and he was a lecturer. So he went to Mongolia to be a missionary, a lecturer in one of the Bible colleges in uh, Ulaanbaatar, the capital city. In 1990, in the 1990s, there were approximately 40 Christians there in the whole of the country. Today, there's approximately 60,000. So from 1990 to now, 40 Christians to 60,000. So now it's approximately 2% of the population are Christians. What happened in the 1990s? What happened in the 1990s that allowed people to more readily consider Christ? It was the fall of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union. More freedom in the country for people to consider Christianity, consider religion. Missionaries were allowed to enter the country for the first time. And it's the same with many other countries around the world, isn't it? When the borders are open, when missionaries can come in, people come to Christ as they respond and hear the gospel. As Christians live more freely and people see their godliness and holiness, that creates doorways for people to consider Christ. And so that's why religious freedoms are important. Not so much for ourselves. I really want to encourage us. Don't just think religious freedoms for ourselves. Think religious freedoms for the sake of others, for those who don't know Jesus. Pray for our government in Australia. Pray that they would continue to allow and allow all the more Christians to live peaceful and quiet lives 
in all godliness and holiness, so that others might come to know Christ. Pray for peace, peace in nations. This was something I found out uh, earlier this week. Sorry, maybe it was last week. I think it was last week. Did you know that prayer brought peace to Germany? Prayer brought down the Berlin Wall. Has anyone heard the story? How prayer brought down the Berlin Wall? Let me tell you the story. It was uh, fascinating. The pastor at St. Nicholas in Berlin, he organized weekly prayer meetings for peace for the nation, Germany. Now, this happened weekly. And seven years later, seven years later, they were getting thousands upon thousands of people at these prayer rallies, prayer meetings for peace. And eventually, there were so many people, they decided to hold a prayer rally, a peace prayer rally. And within a week, the peace prayer rally had grown to guess how many people. Within a week of having this, uh, this peace prayer rally, it had grown to 120,000 people praying for peace, praying for healing and reconciliation. And within a fortnight, the prayer rally had 300,000 people. And four weeks later, to the day of the prayer rally, the Berlin War came tumbling down. Prayer for peace, praying for healing, praying for our nation, praying for the government. As followers of Jesus, we should pray for peace among our nation and other nations. God answers prayer. God wants us to pray for our nation. And I think this is a challenge for us, isn't it? It's a challenge for me. How often do we pray for peace among the nations? How often are we praying for all people? God wants peace in our nations. And now in the passage, Paul gives us three reasons why we should pray for the salvation of our friends and family. Three reasons why we shouldn't give up hope after years of prayer. The first reason is found in verse 3 to 4. It's because God desires people to be saved. Let me read for us. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 to 4. This is good and pleases God our Saviour, who wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. So I want to encourage us, don't give up praying for your friends and family who don't know Jesus, because God wants them to be saved. God can do all things. God is all-powerful. God is all-knowing. God who holds the world in the palm of his hands, he wants your lost friends and family in his kingdom. He wants those who don't know Jesus brought to life. They have been deceived by Satan and what the world has to offer. And God, in this passage we read, he wants them to know the truth. And so if God wants your friends and family who don't know Jesus to know the truth, let that stir confidence in you. Let that encourage you. Let that build, uh, yeah, build confidence to seek the salvation of others. And so that's the first reason. The first reason we shouldn't give up hope is because God wants all people saved. The second reason is this, uh, verse 2. Sorry, not verse 2, uh, point 2, uh, verse 5 to 6. Because God has made the way for salvation possible. You see, God just doesn't speak. He actually does something about it. Let me read verse 5 to 6. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. You see, God doesn't just say he wants people saved and not do anything about it. He actually does something. He sends his son Jesus into the world to die on the cross for the sins of the world. Jesus gives his life as a ransom for people. God has paid that cost, and that cost was the death of his only son, the perfect sinless saviour who didn't deserve to die, but he takes the sin of the world for our salvation so that we can be reconciled to God. And that's how much God wants people to be saved. Think about that for a second. God would want people saved so much that he would send his son to die for them. And the third reason we shouldn't give up hope on the lost is because God sends witnesses to proclaim the truth to the lost. We see this in verse 7. God sends witnesses to proclaim the truth to the lost. Let me read for us verse 6 and 7. This 
has now been witnessed to at the proper time. And for this purpose, I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I am telling the truth. I am not lying. And a true and faithful teacher of the Gentiles. <clears throat> God wants your friends and family to know Jesus. God wants those living in darkness to see the marvelous light. And God will appoint people to go and tell them. And if you're a follower of Jesus, guess who that person might be? It might be you. Or it might be those sitting around you. Matthew chapter 28, the Great Commission. Jesus said, All authority on heaven, in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded. And surely I am with you to the end of the ages. God wants your friends and family to know Jesus, and God has chosen you to be that channel to testify about his goodness through your life, through your holiness, through how you live, and through your words as well, and also through those around you. A couple of months ago, I spoke about merging universes. It's a phrase that a lecturer, uh, Sam Chan, he uses in his book called Evangelism in a Skeptical World. Basically, you have your universe, and in your universe, you have all your Christian friends, and, and you talk Christian language, and you understand what PWA and APWM and uh, PCA and PCNSW, all these words mean. That's your universe here. And other people have their universe, and in their universe, they have a totally different language. The challenge for us as Christians is to merge universes. When they're looking in at our universe, it totally doesn't make sense. Suppose, give, uh, let me give you an example. Suppose I told you something completely unbelievable. A rocket from space landed in the cul-de-sac of where the mantis is located. Would you believe me? Maybe not. Maybe you'd be skeptical. But maybe, what if I told you, no, sorry, what if my neighbor told you the very exact same thing? What if it was reported in the newspaper? You see, you've got um, barriers to uh, believing that a rocket fell, but as more and more people communicate the same thing to you, those barriers begin to come down, don't they? You'll give it more thought, especially if those you know and trust believe it. You see, you are only one person in your friend and family's universe, maybe, who trusts Jesus and knows Jesus. What you need to do, and I encourage you to do this, is merge the universe. And what that means is to encourage them to see that Jesus is uh, plausible and trustworthy. And how you can do that is by introducing them to other people who also love and trust and know Jesus. And Christmas is a good time to do that. As you're having a lot of social events, I think it's so important that your non-Christian friends get to know other Christians who also love Jesus so that following Jesus becomes more of a real possibility and something that's plausible. Create social settings and gatherings where your Christian and non-Christian friends interact. Invite them to church social gatherings. I'm not talking just Sunday church service. I'm talking about social gatherings. Create opportunities where your non-Christian friends can see Christian community in action and following Jesus makes sense. I think that's something that's really helpful for us to consider as a church. So coming back to this passage, don't give up praying for your non-Christian friends and family. God desires for them to be saved. God has made the way possible, and God will use you and others to proclaim the message. But it does raise a question, doesn't it? And it's a perplexing question. If God desires people to be saved, why doesn't he just save everyone? Has anyone heard that before? I've wrestled with that before. Yesterday at Youth Group, we had such a wonderful time with 25 youth uh, from Oran Park. Uh, we had an amazing time. It was uh, 10 out of 10, I told Anna. And there were youth asking uh, these exact questions. Uh, why would God create people if he knew that they were going to hell? Uh, how, how, do we wrestle with, uh, how do we wrestle with the idea that not everyone is saved? We were playing a game at the end of the night and one of the youth came up to me and took me aside and he said to me, Derek, in the Bible it says that there will be no more tears and no more crying. He asked me this question in private and he said, but how will there be no more tears if we know our lost friends and family are going to be in hell? 
how beautiful it is that they were able to ask these questions. And maybe you have those questions as well. This passage says that God desires all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of him. But if God is God, why doesn't he just, just do it? If God is God and he can do all things, why doesn't he just bring everyone into the kingdom? I think, I truthfully think that this is a hard question and one that we have to wrestle with. And I'm probably, uh, well, I won't be able to, I probably won't be able to satisfy your your desire for an answer. But I can tell you that the Bible does say a couple of things. The Bible does say God is completely sovereign over all things. The Bible does say God is the one who calls people into his kingdom. God, the Bible does say God is the one who predestines and saves people. You see, if you recall, just a week or two ago, sorry, two, three weeks ago, we looked at how Paul considered himself the worst of sinners Someone who's the worst of sinners can't, by their own action, do anything to save themselves. Left to our own devices, no one would choose to seek God. There's no one righteous, the Bible says, not even one. Left to our own devices, we would love our sin. We would love to be greedy. We would love to think about ourselves and not God. And so we need God to save us. We can't save ourselves. But also in the Bible, we see the universal nature of God's love. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. So there is a general love, isn't there? A general command to love all people. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son. God doesn't just love some people of the world. He loves all people of the world. He loves his creation. And yet there is that perplexing question. Not all people are saved. We know that. Romans 1 talks about how God gives people over to their sin. God in his sovereignty allows humanity the freedom to reject him. It's like that question of Pharaoh in Exodus. Who hardened Pharaoh's heart? The Bible says Pharaoh hardened his own heart, but it also says God hardened Pharaoh's heart as well. And so that's something that we need to hold in both hands. The fact that God is totally responsible and totally, so sorry, God is totally sovereign over all things. God is totally sovereign and responsible for salvation. God desires all people to be saved on this hand. But God gives people over to their sin. And God doesn't impose salvation on all people. And people reject God by their own action and desire. Keep wrestling with it. I really want to encourage you to. If you have any questions, ask me. And more importantly, I think you should read the Bible and wrestle with it yourself. Pray to God. Ask him. Plead with him. Tell him to reveal himself to you. I think that's the best possible uh, pathway to take part of trusting God is knowing that or well, he's trusting sorry that he knows what's best and part of trusting God is believing that he is God and we are not and that we won't be able to understand everything about God God wants all people to be saved I think part of our problem is not believing that sometimes part of our problem is sometimes we don't realize that Romans chapter 10, verse 14 and 15 says this, How can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is why the scriptures say, How beautiful are the feet of messengers who bring good news. We're organizing Christmas carols in a fortnight's time. Uh, this, is, this could be any event, so just say it was another event. But no one's going to go to the event if no one hears about it, right? No one will consider going to an event if they don't know about it. Let's say it was a movie in a, in a month's time. No one would go if they didn't hear. But at least if we invite them, at least if we tell them, at least then they have an opportunity to go, don't they? No one is going to come to Christ if we don't tell them. I don't want to discount God's sovereignty and how God saves people without, uh, without needing us, but... But in, in a way, we need to tell them. God has commanded that it is through us that people hear. It's what Romans 10 says. How will they hear unless someone tells them? And so I want to I gently ask, when was the last time you told someone about the joy of following Jesus or how Jesus has comforted you and helped you? I'm not asking when was the last time you told a five-minute gospel presentation or, or told them six steps to trusting Jesus. All I'm asking is when was the last time you told someone about how good it is to follow Jesus? When was the last time you told someone that following Jesus is the best thing in the world? I'm not trying to make us feel guilty. 
That's not why I'm asking. But I really do want to cons- uh, do, really do want us to consider why is that? Is it fear? Is it that we don't know what to say? I think sometimes we assume that if we live Christian lives uh, good enough and be nice people and live out our faith, somehow people are going to flock to us and ask us questions about Jesus. And somehow people are going to flock to us wanting to uh, repent and uh, come to know Christ and everyone's going to come to church. But you, you know, don't you? I know. People don't ask. And if they do ask, it's once in a really rare blue moon. You know, if that was the Apostle Paul's mission strategy, it would take years for him to even have a church probably. But I want to encourage us not to be complacent. I want to encourage us to see the urgency of people needing to come to know Christ because God wants them to come to know Christ. The person in your community that you're friends with but doesn't know Jesus and you're waiting for them to ask you about your faith, the sad reality is they could die tomorrow. They could die tomorrow in an accident and stand before the throne of God in judgment and condemnation. That's not intended to shock you, to tell them, but it is intended to say, don't wait. What are you waiting for? Just take the opportunity when it comes. Where will St. Andrews be in 10 years' time? It's a question I've asked for the past seven years, isn't it? And where will St. Andrews be in 10 years' time? And the sad reality is, if we're not loving Jesus, if we're not telling people about Jesus, if we're not calling people to repent, then sad, sadly St. Andrews will be nowhere. And so I want to plead with us. See the urgency. God wants people to be saved. And God wants to use you as his vessel to tell people. God is faithful. He wants people to know Christ. If you have friends and family who don't know Jesus, keep praying for them. Keep pleading that God would open up doorways to draw them into his kingdom. Don't lose hope. Trust that God is good, that he is faithful, and he's in control. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are faithful, that you want people in your kingdom. We pray, Father, that you would work salvation in the hearts of those who are lost. Please give us courage. Please help us to make the most of every opportunity to tell people about how joyful it is to know Jesus, how sweet it is to be able to feast on your word, and how much of a delight it is to be adopted into your kingdom, into your family. And so please, Father, open up blind eyes, soften hardened hearts, draw people into your kingdom by faith, and please use us as your channels to do so. In Jesus' name, amen.